It's almost Halloween and I'm dressed up as Lightning McQueen or maybe as Pit Crew? No. You know what? I don't even know what I am. It's, it's something Cars related. But I wanted to come up with the scariest iRacing related video I could think of for this. And you know what I knew would scare all you guys? freshman college level physics. So today I'm going to be proving to you why you are bad at tire saving using physics. But this all revolves around one concept, the anti-arc or the Larry line. You can call it many things, but in oval racing, a lot of the times tire saving is done with a very unintuitive line where you turn in early into the corner instead of arcing it like you would normally think that you would need to. But why is this the case? Well, I thought about it for a bit, took what I knew from school, and tried to prove it via physics. I'm gonna to try to not get into exact numbers too much because that's just overly confusing and stay conceptual. And I'm not 100% sure I got all of this right, so I await all of you guys in the comments roasting me on my memory of all this crap. Just to show you guys that I know what I'm talking about, this is my totally legit engineering degree from the Institute of Supreme Capability. Don't ask me where that's located, I took online classes. But anyways, let's take a look at two very commonly taught racing lines. If you've seen any sort of racing instruction video, this is probably the two lines that you are taught. The first one on the left is for hairpin tight corners and it includes a heavy braking zone followed by a late apex. And then the corner on the right is a wider corner, similar to what you would find in most ovals, where they do gradual slowing and apex in the center of the corner. In both cases, you're trying to get a run off the corner. But my question to you guys is why do I teach tire saving lines like this, this blue line here, where I drive as early as I can into the corner and get there as early as possible and still try to get the same exit? Doesn't that just look completely inefficient? Well, let's think what's different between this go-kart on this track and a NASCAR on most NASCAR tracks, and that is going to be the banking. So as you can see here, let's consider a cross section. So I'm gonna be doing something called free body diagrams where I take an object, I place it on the ground or on the surface, and then we calculate the forces that are acting on the object, and you'll see a bunch of arrows. It'll be pretty simple because we don't have to do very many real calculations, so we'll kind of go through it as we go along. So you can see that this car on the right is pretty much represented by this green box on the surface. So what forces are at play on the car in the center of a corner? Well, the first that is probably the most obvious for people is the gravitational force. The car is being pulled down into the earth and that force is equal to the mass times gravitational acceleration. And this might actually change, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So a NASCAR car weighs about 3,400 pounds, which is equal to about 15,000 Newtons. And yes, true Americans know that the metric system is the best to use in physics. So don't even talk about that. But on a perfectly normal system, this force should be equal to just the weight of the car, but we'll see in a little bit why that's not always the case. The next force that acts on the car is not really a real force, but it's, it's resultant of other forces so we can simplify it. And that is the centrifugal force that pushes outward on the car straight into the banking it looks like. It's basically the circle that the car is driving around. The force points straight out from that. And this is calculated by this equation here. It looks very complicated, but really you just need to know that the force is equal to the mass and then the square of the velocity. So the velocity has a bigger impact on the force than the mass does. And then the radius will always be fixed for a given track. I put it into a calculator and I calculated that the centripetal force in this system is about double that of the weight of the car. These numbers were for Talladega rough estimate, not gonna be exact, but not very far off. There's another force at play, and this is the normal force. This is one of the forces that's kind of harder to visualize, but it's literally the track pushing back up against your car, and it pushes straight away from the track, so perpendicular. So we can see here, I draw this arrow so it points out of the box and 
out of the track. If we were on a flat surface, it'd be going straight up, but because we're on a bank surface, it goes perpendicular away from the track, okay? So this force here should completely cancel out the gravitational force or else the car would be floating up in the air or sinking into the ground or something like that. In a perfect system where there's no turning, where there's no other forces, this is the way that we counteract these forces. And so the way that we resolve all of this is in a system where let's say the car is going completely straight, you can get through the corner without any turn of the wheel, without any other forces in play. Basically, we cancel out all of these forces by turning the one force to the right, canceling that out with the force to the left and up, and then the up component is canceled by the down component. You can kind of visualize here how if you added all of these arrows together, it would just go back to nothing. And that's how we know a system is at equilibrium. So we call this a complete system, even though this is very simplified. This is for a track that is kind of like Talladega. Talladega is pretty close to this, but that's not how the majority of tracks are, especially ones where you want a tire save at. So what is up? We have a centrifugal force at a track like Dover, where the radius is smaller and the speed is not that much smaller. And we see that the force at a place like Dover is much higher than the force at a place like Talladega, the centripetal force or the centrifugal force. Don't worry about that. That's just kind of terminology and stuff. So what are we missing that we have a force that we can't counteract? How are we gonna counteract this force that goes more and more and more to the right if we can only have an up and down uh, force and the one that goes slightly to the left? Well, what we can do is first off, this normal force I lied to a little bit ago because this force can actually increase by two to three times generally. And this is actually the same thing as G's. Like you say, oh, he felt five G's in the corner or he hit the wall and he felt 40 G's. This is basically the same thing as your weight increasing by two to three times. So therefore, the normal force that you experience on the track will actually increase by two to three times when you're in the corner. This is because of downforce in the car. This is because of the normal force Force that is reacting off of the uh, the track as you are being pushed into it. So keep that in mind and we will think about that later. But what we're really interested in for tire saving is friction force from the tires. This is the fourth force that the car can add to the system where we can resolve all of these forces uh, without having to leave anything out. So we have introduced friction force. And friction force applied on a tire leads to tire wear. It is tire wear. You don't get tire wear without friction force on the tires and you can't apply a friction force on the tires without experiencing tire wear. That's material science. And I think that's pretty, uh, it's pretty easy to understand. So we're just gonna kind of go on from that and go back to the physics. How is friction applied to a tire? there is a couple of ways. The first that we don't really care about is the tire rolling and accelerating or slipping in a straight line. Think of a burnout, think of driving off of pit road. Those things can add friction force to the tires or the tire force uh, adds friction force to the system to accelerate the system. This is not what we're worried about because we aren't really more or less going in a, in a, a constant speed uh, if we break it down. So we don't worry about this force. What we do worry about is the lateral force that shears across the tire. So the lateral force that literally, if this is a tire, I'm going across it perpendicularly. That is what cheese graters the rubber. It shreds the rubber if you do enough to it. But how do we get a tire to do that? Well, the first way that we can do it is on the front tires where we simply can just turn the steering wheel, create an angle in between the tire and the racing surface and have a surface shear per, uh, proportional to the angle that the tires are at. And this is understeer. Now, just because you have your wheels turned doesn't mean that you are adding friction force to the system because if the tires are in line with the racing surface and your direction of motion, then you are not adding friction to the system. But in that moment where you turn the car, 
that will cause that friction force in order to change the direction of your car, to change the angle. So that is, in that moment, understeer. The other thing that you can do with this is oversteer, and that's when you disengage the rear tires from the car. So instead of the front tires disengaging, you are disengaging the rear tires. And we can do this with things like brake bias. We can do this with throttle at certain tracks, you name it. But what's very important in certain cases is to balance the oversteer with the understeer or drive the car neutrally to have as most evenly split oversteer and understeer so that we have similar tire wear on each tire. So that's a very important concept for tire management in terms of how you drive the car. But this is not what we're super worried about at this moment because we're trying to figure out why the line is so different for tire saving. So let's go back to our system. Now, if you try to resolve this system, you'll find that the square of the tire force is equal to the square of the net right forces minus the square of the net up forces. This is just simple trigonometry. Everything's a right triangle here, but all you need to worry about here is that blue arrow. With the blue arrow, we are trying to minimize the size of that blue arrow to have this system add up to zero in equilibrium. But if you think about it, this shouldn't change too much. And even if it does, what are we going to do about it? There's not really anything else that we can add to the system besides friction force and evening them out between the tires as best as possible. So that's true. To a point, this is unavoidable and you just want to balance the tires out. But beyond that, we haven't considered one thing. What happens if we want to accelerate an object down the track. So we don't want this system to be in equilibrium anymore. I wanna be at the top of the track and I want to end at the bottom of the track. What is required for that? Well, we need to accelerate the system, the car, laterally down the track. So what does that mean though? The only force that we can do this with is the friction force from the tires. Everything else is fixed in a system whether we want it to be accelerating or we want it to be equal. So we can see here, you have to add a lot of friction force from the tires to get the car to turn down the track. Doesn't matter if it's in a banked part of the track or if it's in a straight part of the track. But if you're in a banked part of the corner, you will need a lot of force to counteract all of this other force and then accelerate the car down the track. It should be fairly proportional though to if we were doing it on a flat surface. This blue arrow looks pretty small, but the blue arrows should be more or less equal to the difference between the size of the blue arrows when you're already in the corner. So why is turning on a straightaway and not on the banking so much better? Well, it's because of the static friction. It turns out that the friction between the tires and the, the track have their own formula and it turns out to be completely proportional to the normal force of the car. So the static force by definition is the amount of force that is needed to get an object to move. So you know that when, let's say that you put a, a sofa on a carpet you put a lot of force into the sofa and it doesn't move at all. It doesn't move at all. But then suddenly it starts moving when you push it. That amount of force that it takes to get it to start is the static friction force. And then from there, there is a lesser force needed to keep the car moving. But that force that's needed to get the couch started to move is what we're worried about because we are trying to get our car to go from high to low. And once it starts going, it'll be great. But that starting instant is what we're worried about. So if we look at this equation, the static force is equal or less than the coefficient of static friction, which is the same between both of these concepts because the tire is always going to be on the same asphalt. So that's the same, don't worry about that. And then the normal force. Now, if you remember from earlier, the normal force increases in the banking. We go from driving at about one G on the straightaway to two to three Gs in the track, in the banking. So we are increasing our static friction by two to three times 
if we have to do it in the banking versus out of the banking. The lateral acceleration happens within a very short time. It's when you get your car first turned into the corner. That's the most important part of the corner. If you do this moment while you're in the banking, you need double or triple the force from your tires and AKA double or triple the tire wear from your tires to get the car turned versus if you were to turn before the banking transition. So this is where almost all of the avoidable tire wear can happen. When someone says that you can go about as fast while still not having to worry about your tires too much, this is what they're talking about. Because if you just time your turns right before you need all of that extra friction force, the car will turn much easier. You might get to where you wanna go a little bit earlier, but you can compensate that with throttle control, early throttle, and once you are at equilibrium in your system on your racing line, then you need much less tire force and everything is a lot more easy to control. Now, keep in mind, you still need to balance the oversteer and understeer in your car in most situations where you really want the car to be driving neutral so that you can apply the forces evenly between both tires. But the biggest mistake that I see people make is that they think that wide arc is faster. And sure, it might be, but it's not that much faster to where you need to put two to three times the amount of wear in your right front tire in order to do it. So hopefully this helps you guys visualize tire savings because this is kind of how I've always done it in my head without realizing it. But let me know in the comments below if you have any other questions. All right, thank you all for watching. Hope you have a wonderful day. Hope to see you all on the track.